Looking back, you know what's the nice thing about having owned six bikes? You gain a lot of perspective. And then the nice thing about having followed the progression tree of a 250 to a 600 to 1000s of different types means that you gain an appreciation for each class and era of motorcycle. Each upgrade allows you to see exactly what that class or era did better than the previous one, or even vice versa. Most would argue that uh, you end up a better rider because of it too. Now if you've been around on my channel long enough, odds are you've heard me complain about my lack of storage options and a good workspace. Prior to purchasing this Honda, I actually kept the BMW K100 I finished building in an indoor storage facility for a cheap, albeit inconvenient solution thanks to the lazy hours of the facility. And I keep the FC1 on the inner sidewalk in front of my building. For all the complaining that I do, I'm at least actually lucky enough to not have to park my bike on the street every night and day. My family owns the building and the bike is not only out of the way of thieves and bad drivers, but we can see and hear anything that happens to it. But what about the instance where I don't even have that luxury? See, I already explained in posts on YouTube and Instagram, so I won't go super deep into detail, but the gist of it is that I've come into some better income and I would like to move to a new location. Not outside of New York City, but potentially somewhere that might not have a dedicated parking spot for me to park my motorcycle. Naturally, that means exposing my bike to the horrors of street parking in New York City. Be it an unmarked minivan with three burly guys in it going shopping, or the uninsured permit driving teen girl who is exceptionally good at bumper cars. It's all about perspective, and for all the complaining that I do, I've definitely been spoiled in parking and having a small but at least out of the way workspace. I would be a paranoid wreck parking a bike as nice as the FZ1 on the street. But not even thinking about that, right? What about the cheap insurance cost of an older slower bike? I'll have rent to worry about and I already factor in the storage unit fee of 50 bucks for the BMW into my payments for my bikes every month. What about if something breaks? I mean, the FC1 is a modern, complicated machine and I won't have access to the huge catalog of tools that have amassed over decades at my parents' house. I also won't have a spot to keep the bike in pieces if the wrench job has to get stopped short for a few days. I'll be working on a curb and I don't even want to think about how annoying it would be to strip down a modern sport bike with plastics and everything before even getting to the problem that you're trying to fix. So why a CB550 exactly? Well, it didn't have to be a CB550, but it did have to be a 1970s and early 80s. So over the course of about a month, I just kept watching uh, bike after bike go up on sale on Craigslist until I came across this very CB550 in question one night. I got back to the seller within 11 minutes of, of the ad going live and I basically gave it the approach of, hi, I'm going to buy that bike tomorrow. When do you want to meet? Normally, I always screenshot the advertisement for the sake of posterity, but I was moving so quickly that I, I totally forgot to do that. Uh, essentially, the seller was fully forthcoming with the issues that the bike had. It was three main issues. No key, no battery, but he did have a battery to give me. And uh, the tank needed cleaning because it was full of rust. The last sticker that the bike was issued reads 2017, which would have been issued in 2016. So the bike was sitting for about four years, meaning the carbs would definitely need to, need to be cleaned out to really get it to run right. But it could probably at least start up with a, you know, without a carb clean. Three very simple problems driving the price down to $1,400. So I jumped on it and headed on over after work. I didn't even care about the fact that I had no real practical way to get it home. I just wanted that title in my name first and foremost. My job has a location nearby to the cellar, so he, I'd have probably just walked it to 30 minutes to keep it behind the building until I figure out how to get it home. I've never bought a, a not running bike, you know, I always just rode the bikes dirty to get them home after the sale, so this was new territory. So I had 2J come along to help out. On July 8th, while standing over the bike, the seller was saying all the right things and I bought the bike. I should have given it a closer look because those three simple uh, issues that were mentioned were not the only issues. I would have still bought the bike, but I would have rightfully beat him down on the price to reflect that. We'll get to that later though. Right, now we gotta get the bike home. Now we had a bystander recommend using a rope to pull the Honda along. He provided the rope to us and uh, he gave us a quick lesson on towing and the rest was history. Three and a half miles of history. Go, go. Oh shit, I had more, uh... Go, go, yeah, I'm good. Fucking F-150 FZ-1. <laughs> go, go, go. Go hold on. Hey, nigga, are you gonna go or stare? <laughs> slow, keep it slow. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. We're good, we're good, we're good. We're good, we're good, we're good. We're good. We're good. Okay. It's just fighting the turning of the left, you know, the handlebar. Bro! I was... Go. Yeah, hold on. Just keep it slow, though. Keep it slow, keep it slow, keep it slow, keep it slow. Go, go, go ahead. Okay. All right. Oh, 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 oh yeah, we're good. Okay. Go ahead. Wait, slow down. Don't... When you pull off, do it slowly. Go ahead. 
Yes, sir. Go ahead. Pull. Yep, yep pull. Go ahead. Okay, we're good. Thank you. Oh, nice. Well, I hope we're not taking a jacket. <laughs> okay. Yo, right when he said jacket, I'm like, what? Now the key to towing is that you make sure that the rope is taut at all times. The most difficult part is launching because obviously if you just yank the back bike, it's dangerous. So you have to kind of launch like a snail until the moment is right and then you pick up speed so it stays taut. You have to take turns wide so that the rope doesn't get stuck in anyone's tire. It was sketchy, but I mean by the end of it, we both agreed with each other that it was actually kind of fun. So I mean, shout out to 2J for the clutch assist there. Oh, and also the guy for giving two strangers a rope goes to show how much bikers will look out for each other. So with the bike in my place, I waited for a good dry day to do a walk around. Overall, the bike appeared to have good structure, but I mean, a lot of ugly. The headlight was mounted way too high. The, uh, the tank was ugly because they didn't clear coat the raw finish, so it just started rusting. I don't really like the seat at all because uh, I don't really like like large upholstered seat humps. Um, the black side covers looked out of place, but it definitely pulled off that beetle look pretty well. The Honda four cylinders from the 1970s were single overhead cam, two valve air cooled engines renowned for simplicity. Uh, the 550 application puts out a brisk 50 horsepower through a five speed transmission into a chain drive. Carbureted, obviously, wasted spark ignition through two coils, and it'll rev up to 11,000 RPM, but by then you're just moving faster than the two valves can keep up, and you're way past the peak power anyway, just making more noise. The clip-ons are clearly custom. Uh, these came with handlebars from the factory, but the owner clearly didn't even bother to shorten the cables and such. Overall, the cafe conversion was pretty sloppy on this bike. Like, it was cafe'd out real quick, but for the most part, this is actually a great thing for me. See, I don't really want a cafe racer. I, I want a good daily rider. So I'm happy that they didn't shorten the cables because I'll likely throw a drag bar that's sitting in my basement on there. I'm glad they didn't try anything weird with the wiring, although the wiring is a bit screwy, which we'll get into. I'm glad they didn't weld a tail hoop on there because, I mean, for now, I just want to put the stock seat back on. They did cut the mounts off, but that could be fixed. And that's why I call this Operation Decaf, because I want to remove some of the cafe race aspects of this bike. But obviously the first part is to make this thing run. This process was documented pretty he pretty heavily on uh, Instagram stories, so a lot of the footage was pulled from there. And I mean, like, there's a lot of things that are left out, but, um, you know, it is what it is. And a lot of it, a lot of it is going to be in portrait orientation sometimes, so I do apologize for that, but let's jump in. Step number one on any bike is to get the seat off, followed by the gas tank. One bolt for the seat, and then the tank slides off right after. I gotta be honest, it looks way better without that seat already. First thing I noticed though was that there was a battery in there. It was just left to die. In preparation for cleaning the tank, I had to remove the fuel lines to duct tape the petcock valve. With modern bikes, hell, even late 80s modern bikes like my BMW, you'd be undoing bolts, electrical connections for the, uh, the senders, the pumps, fuel lines, return lines, fairings, etc. You know, just to get the tank off. With this, it's just two fuel lines that go to the exact same spot, and then the tank slides out without leaking. Now, as you can see, the previous owner deleted the airbox in favor of velocity stacks. Now these look and sound cool, but honestly I'd have gone for pod filters myself just for the health of the engine. I also did notice quite a few electrical components and connections missing or just downright cut, which was a big concern for sure. So it was time to solve two of the three issues as advertised. The seller provided me a lithium ion battery for free, which I don't really like because I've had three lithium batteries go bad on me, and by the end of this video, it'll be four. <laughs> But it was free and I have it. So I also took the time to order an ignition set and a key. And uh, I bought it so that it, it would arrive when I, you know, when I started wrenching. So I bought it basically as soon as I got the bike home. Now after installing the ignition, 
The only indication that I was getting any power was the aftermarket dashboard lighting up. Nothing else worked, which at the time I assumed was because of uh, several missing connections. Not even the starter button worked, which told me that this bike needed a lot more than just a key and a battery. I wanted to see where that huge cluster of cut wires was connected to, so I removed the front sprocket cover and got in there. Turns out the yellow wires went to the alternator, the blue went to the oil pressure switch, and the green went to the neutral switch to ground the starter solenoid or relay. I later realized that this is why the starter wasn't getting any power with the button press, because there was no ground. In any case, I was not understanding why these wires were cut to begin with, and I had to find a few other things missing around the bike to come to the assumption that of course, over the, uh, the course of four years or so that it sat, people were just picking parts off of it in the shop because uh, it sat in like, you know, those community shops. So, you know, hey, I need this part, I need that part. They just take it off the bike because it was sitting there for so long and the guy would just let them, I guess. So I went and ordered a few electrical bits to get it sorted out and then turned my attention to the gas tank. Inside of the gas tank was full of thick rust, not just surface rust but chunks of it because the previous owner couldn't be bothered to fill it with oil or something. de in a tank can be done in a few ways. You can use rust removers or various types of acids, and these products are naturally not only very harsh to a human, but also harsh to metal. That's why it works. So when working with acids and such, you have to protect yourself and be quick with using it before it eats the good metal after it eats the rust. And then you have to dispose of it carefully and morally. Hmm. Sure, it would be quicker, but I wasn't in a rush, so instead I just used the vinegar and bolts method. The reason for that is on top of not wanting to deal with the safety and disposal hazards of acid, I knew it was going to be a while before the bike was running. After the rust and the inner coating comes off from the acid, I would have to get it out immediately and fill the tank up with gas so it wouldn't flash rust since I wasn't planning to recoat the inside. So nah, just throw some vinegar, some leftover BMW bolts in there and just let it sit for a week and a half. The vinegar eats away at the rust very slowly and if you shake the tank around, the bolts will knock off the heavy bits since you can't get a hand in there and scrape it off yourself. I could pretty much just leave the vinegar in there for as long as I need to without like eating a hole in the tank like acid would. And then once I'm done getting the bike running, I'll just throw some gas in the tank and that's that. $15 worth of vinegar and some old bolts. Alright, so check this out, right? So I had to replace the ignition barrel because the previous owner lost the key to the old one. This one came with a key and everything. So if I turn the key, I get dashboard, I get lights and everything. Only thing I get is dashboard and um, neutral light. So when I hit the start button, Nothing happens, but if I jump the solenoid with screwdriver, I do get started. Uh, so what that tells me is either the solenoid is bad or uh, there's a, something around the bike stopping the bike from starting. Now, in his infinite wisdom, the previous owner cut the clutch switch and also the neutral switch. So what I think is that there's a safety feature that's stopping the bike from starting with the button. Um, so I'm gonna have to either bypass that or replace these wires or something. I don't know, but that's a relief because it wasn't starting. I thought something worse was, you know, the problem. Since I know that the starter does work, I started troubleshooting by testing the wires at the hand switch itself. The solid black wires are powered at all times to go to the starter button and the engine run switch before it branches out into different wires. For the starter button, it runs to a yellow and red wire down to the solenoid when you hit the button. I used my test light to see if it was getting power, and once I saw that it was, I skipped all the way down to the solenoid itself to see if the power was making it through the length of the bike, which it was. This is important because what it tells me is that the solenoid is indeed getting a 12 volt positive signal, but the issue is that it's not grounded. And that's when I learned that indeed the neutral or clutch switch is the issue here. Now for the sake of verifying if the solenoid was working, I would have to just ground it directly. So I grabbed some extra moto gadget wire and a clamp, shoved the wire into the, connect, into the connection where the uh, neutral switch would go, and then grounded it directly to the battery. Thank you. 
<clears throat> so I made some progress with the whole starting issue. This switch is actually, it gets positive at all times. And when you press the starter button, it actually just sends it to the, um, the solenoid. The solenoid has to be grounded through the neutral switch or the clutch switch. Now I verified that the 12 volts is getting to the switch, to the, the handlebar switch, through these black wires here. So these are 12 volts all the time. What happens is it goes into the switch, you press the starter button, and it goes to this yellow wire, which then makes it to this yellow and red wire right here, where that um, test light is poking. Now the reason why I know that this positive is getting through, there's no issues there, because if I hit the starter button, that light comes in. So that tells me that the positive is okay. Everything is getting through from the handlebars to the solenoid. Now what I said before is that the bike has a clutch and neutral um, switch that stops the solenoid from grounding. That's how it grounds from this wire here. But as you can see, everything's cut. So what I did was, is I sourced where that ground wire goes in this connector, which is the middle far left. That's where this blue wire is coming from. And I grounded it directly to the battery Then start him. So I'm gonna have to find a way to either reconnect this, I don't know how, or just have it grounded. Grounded at all times, like just have this directly connected to ground, not connected to the battery, but maybe somewhere on the frame, like, you know, put it under a bolt, like, you know, a bolt like this or whatever. Um, also, for some reason I'm not getting spark. So I'm gonna have to look into that the same way I looked into this. But it's more or less the same thing. 12 volts goes to the um the switch and then it comes back down to the coils. Just gotta figure out which wires is what. You're looking at my diagram. So all of that was just for the for the starter button. But what about the engine start stop button? Switch rather. So you set it to run. <clears throat> and the black, like I said, the black wires are 12 volt at all times to the switch. But for the actual ignition system, the black Black and white is the return wire to the coils. Now, the light comes on when I hit the engine start stop. If I leave it on, the ignition system is getting power, right? Black and white wire. That goes to the coils, which branches off right here. If I put the, uh, if I put the light there, I get light to the, the tester. So everything's good there. So power going to the coils is good. Now these two, the yellow and the blue, go to the points ignition. So if I test these, kind of hard to do with one hand, but you see I'm getting power there. And then this one, uh, if I can find the hole that I made, there you go. So these both are getting power. These both go to the, uh, the uh, points. So I'm like, you know what, how, how are the points? Because Everything's good here, everything's good at the coils. So how are the points doing? Do me a favor. Tell me if you see an issue here. What is the issue here? All my all my mechanically inclined people, what's the issue right here? The issue is that there are no points whatsoever on this bike. The points are basically the contact breakers that ride on a cam lobe connected directly to the crank of the engine. If you ever heard of an old distributor, it's sort of like that. It predates electronic sensor-based ignition systems. Essentially, the uh, system lets the coils know when to fire the plugs for each cylinder. And <laughs> something that crucial is gone. It's no wonder why I'm not getting no spark whatsoever. I mean, the things that generate the spark are completely gone. I reckon like it was sitting around and somebody was like, oh dude, I need your points. Can I, can I take your points? And the guy's like, sure, take my points. But I guess the bright side is that, you know, everything else is pretty much good. You know, coil wires seem good. Spark plugs didn't look too bad when I pulled them. Just a little bit of soot. So, basically, I just gotta buy this uh, points. I could go electric. That was a common upgrade. People change the points to electric uh, ignition. But I'm gonna keep it simple. You know, just for now. Just get a go on eBay, buy a set of points, condenser, all that. Just throw it on the bike just to get it running. Anything crazy like that could come later. But, yeah. I guess I should have checked that earlier. Never assume that your bike actually comes with an ignition system. That's just too much to ask for. 
So I ordered the points plate and shifted gears to focus on the carburetors. I was going to do those last, but I was pretty much stuck at this point and had to wait for the points. Tank was still soaking, so there was no point to wait with the carbs. Classic Octane on YouTube has a pretty fantastic tutorial on how to rebuild a set of 550 carbs, and that helped carry me through the process. I haven't rebuilt the carbs since like 2015, and that was just one. But if you move carefully and keep organized, even though you're working on four of them at once, it's a breeze. Flow bowls look pretty rough and the jets were indeed backed up, but what do you expect? The real problem was the fact that the owner definitely lied about the carb jet. See, when you change the exhaust or the intake system, in this case, velocity stacks in a four into one, you're supposed to change the jets to a larger size. This way, the extra airflow is matched by extra fuel. Without doing that, you'll just run lean with all the issues that that brings. I asked if it was jetted and he said yes, but I don't think he was being malicious. I think he just had no idea what he was talking about. So I ordered a jet kit and when I rebuilt the set, I put some 110s in there to replace the 100s. I let the smaller parts from the carb sit in some carb cleaner for a while, which was like a good excuse to take a break from the carb job, it's kind of like letting dishes soak. <laughs> but I did get a shipment of parts, some of which were uh, electrical components to try and get everything connected, and some of which were for the gas tank. And it finally motivated me to dump that cesspool of vinegar and rust that was sitting out for 11 days. I mean, vinegar is a strong smell. Now imagine a few gallons of it chemically reacting under 98 degrees sun of July. Yeah, it wasn't pleasant, but it was time to dump it. Looks like an interstate gas station bathroom. Even after all that, the vinegar is still reactive, so I used, uh, I used it to remove the surface rust on the outside of the tank with a little bit of sandpaper. Just dip it in the gas station toilet and then sand it. I clear coated the outside of it this time, unlike the previous owner. Then I used boiling water and dish soap to completely clean out the rest of the tank, basically running water through it until it would come out completely clear and drinkable. I didn't test that last part. I also didn't go super hard on, it, on, on like polishing it or anything because to be honest, I don't plan to permanently keep this tank anyway. This was just like a $15 solution to a problem. A nice tank may come a little bit later on. One of the following days after that, I went ahead and installed the, uh, the regulator, the rectifier, the flasher relay from the donor panel, ran some more electrical tests, and I finished rebuilding the carburetors. You know what's the other thing that you can't assume that the previous owner did right? Is plug everything in in the right places. So I was looking at this, this mess of wires and like things just wasn't happening the way they should. Like just looking at the diagram, like uh, I had uh, this blue plugged into like a light blue, one of these light blues. 
and like just things weren't happening. So I basically just unplugged everything I possibly could and then just looked at the diagram and traced everything back to the right colors. With this, it's supposed to be going to another blue because it's the, it's the um, high beam, but they extended the wire and then taped it off for some reason. I had to like untape it because it was taped off with some other wires, but I connected it and we got high beam with the switch too. So I know the switch is actually good. But yeah, that's crazy. Like I thought, I thought at least <laughs> like the things, you know, important stuff would be plugged in and like the problem wouldn't be that they were just simply plugged into the wrong stuff. But I mean, I guess, I, I guess that's the best problem to have, right? So just gotta tr trace all these wires back. But the diagram, you know, you do it one by one, step by step, it's not that hard to do. After I did that, the points plate had finally arrived. Now, I would have installed them, but they came 10 minutes too late, and it's too hard to step back outside these days. Now, I did install them the next day, and I was getting spark. It was weak spark, but spark nonetheless. When I went to work, I just picked up a new set of spark plugs, which turned out to be a good move because the ones in the bike weren't even a recommended kind. I knew something was fishy when the socket size was different from what the forum guys said. Oh, and they were cheap too, 10 bucks for a set after tax. Check this out. The problem is that even after installing the new plugs, the engine would still bloop bloop every so often, but not actually run. Some of this 1 and 4 were getting hot, but 2 and 3 weren't. This told me that this was an ignition issue. Essentially, I just had to clean the points, set the gap for the, uh, for the points, and then set the timing. The spark plugs were firing, but just way too early with the current timing. Basically, it was enough to bloop, but not enough to start. Very simple fix. About 20 minutes with a screwdriver, sandpaper, contact cleaner, and here you go. So I put the new points in there. Well, I say new, but the only points I got, I put these in there and I kind of just threw them on. I didn't really do much cleaning, much adjustment and all that. And um, they were out of adjustment. So I had to adjust them this morning. And, and the gap was too much. Uh, they weren't firing at the right time. Like they were firing too early. And it was turning over, but it was just bloop, 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 bloop. It wouldn't start. Um, so I took a look at the time and, and got that all sorted. But the other thing, the reason why I don't want to run it too long is because I don't see much oil in here. Like, I don't know how to read this dipstick. But like when I look in there, I don't see much. So I'm going to get me some 1040 also. Oil pump is leaking like crazy. You can see, you can see where it's streaming down right there. The pump naturally only leaks while the engine is turning, so all the starter motor turning made it leak. I asked the guy if it had any leaks, and he said no. Very good. But I did already have the pump rebuild kit because I noticed this leak a few days before, which show up when the, uh, the when I was cranking the starter. Also, also, I, <laughs> I destroyed this lithium-ion battery, which I have the tendency to do because I did it twice on the K100. Those two anti-gravity batteries, yeah, I destroyed those. So I ended up just getting, um, actually, one of these and putting it on the K100. This is the battery from this thing. So I just put it on here because, you know, lead acid, can't go wrong with that. I don't like lithium ion, but this was free with the bike. So, I mean, there's no love loss for me. So there was oil, but it's completely black. With the engine full of fresh oil, I had to check to see if uh, we were getting oil pressure. The switch is the same as it was on the K100. All it does is ground the warning light when there's no pressure. It should turn off when the engine is running. If the engine is running and that light is still on, you need to kill the engine immediately.
make it a sound. I thought this exhaust would be a lot louder than it is, but it's, it's actually disappointingly tasteful. Also, it looks like the larger jets did the trick because it's not back, back backfiring at all. The only real problem is that the oil pump is still leaking even with those new O-rings, so I have to take a look into that. The goal was to get this thing running and then put it into storage so I could work on the FZ and get it ready to sell. I went ahead and put everything away for the day. Tomorrow, well, I will take it for a spin. A dirty spin, but whatever. Now you'll have to excuse the GoPro angle, but this bike is interesting because it's more comfortable than it looks, it sounds faster than it is, and it handles better than I thought. I didn't give it too much beans though because I didn't touch the brakes and they're four years past due for service. Crap on the exhaust is burning off right now. And the uh, drain plug could do with a Titan. Yeah, drain plug and then that leak at the uh, oil pump. Don't go away. storage place. I'll have to put this thing in the storage so I can work on the FZ1. Take this battery off. It's from the FZ1. Kind of crabby how I rigged it up, but you gotta do what you gotta do. Oh, say so I to the BMW too. Dang, I just realized I'm walking home. <laughs> Unfortunately, I actually left the um, BMW 
battery plugged in and it's dead now i left it plugged in for too long it's been like a couple months since i rode this thing and uh yeah <laughs> i don't know if that's that's coming back to life but maybe i mean i still get lights just that it won't fire up still gotta get this oil leak fixed i guess the real problem is coming out when the oil warms up it's coming out crazily still gotta tune like the idle and stuff like that get it running perfectly did good though it's fun because you get that sport sound but it's not super fast well that's a wrap indeed that is a wrap thanks for watching and keep an eye out for this bike in the near future and any other moves that i might make